Okay. Two seconds here. Okay. Good Friday morning, everyone. It is the day after Thanksgiving, which means uh, most people are off work today, but not the backyard naturalist. We keep going rain, shine, or holiday uh, coming to your backyard from my backyard, uh, from my backyard attic, where I can see my front yard, which is graced with many native plants and um, totally clear skies. I was hoping I'd be able to reference the, the clouds uh, after last week's awesome cloud talk and, and so much that I learned, but there's not a cloud in the sky, which means high pressure, which means descending air. Um, and uh, really excited that Dr. Call has already committed to talk again in the spring. He's got a, a few other talks on atmospheric sciences, so I'm really excited for that. Uh, today is the day after many in the United States gather with family and friends and good food. Um, and we celebrate with some of the tasty foods that have evolved here in the Americas. And one of those tasty foods is the cranberry. Uh, so I've got stories about cranberries and hopefully you have the time to enjoy with me the stories as we bring you episode 13 of season four of the Backyard Naturalist, Red and Buried. First, as always, to give my thanks to you on this day after Thanksgiving. I'm grateful that you're here with us today. Uh, thank you. If you're a member of the Urban Ecology Center or and or a subscriber to Backyard Naturalist series, thank you again. Uh, there are many ways that I would like to give my thanks today, including announcing the next subscriber appreciation field trip. So these are the, uh, there it is. These are the monthly explorations of the backyards of the Milwaukee area. And on December the 10th, yeah, December 9th, I hope you can join me for a stroll through one of Milwaukee's most iconic parks, uh, Lake Park uh, on the on the coast of Milwaukee. The park has a rich history and we'll explore that a little bit, but we'll also be mainly looking for the critters and processes that we've been exploring here on the Backyard Naturalist. There, there are people that give real history tours. That's This isn't gonna be a history tour, but this is gonna be more of a ecological and, and mixed with a little social history tour. Um, so I look forward to it and I hope you can join. It is open to everyone and free to subscribers. Um, I skipped, here's what happened. I skipped a slide. Uh, like to give thanks to, in advance, thanks to next week's Backyard Naturalist host, Michelle Milford. Uh, and if you're curious which one of these organisms, organisms is Michelle, uh, she's the only two-legged, two-legged, non-feathered uh, organism, the one on the right. Uh, she's going to bring us into the world of backyard chickens. We've already seen backyard pigeons and backyard bees. Um, and now we're on to another potential den denizen of our urban backyards. Uh, should be a fantastic episode next week. I'm really looking forward to watching it. Unfortunately, the usual research team members uh, will be on an eco-travel trip to the Indiana Dunes, but honorary research team member Tori will be here along with Michelle uh, so this is an episode that I'll just have to watch after the fact, which reminds me that all of the past Backyard Naturalists, uh, ranging from uh, Mitch Ah's wonderful eco tour through photos uh, to Planetarium show with Bob Bonadur of the Milwaukee Public Museum, to the March Mammal Madness show uh, with Chris Yankee from Stevens Point, to the history episode with John Gerda, they all can be found on the UEC's YouTube channel or by putting uh, in, entering in UEC in my backyard into your search engine. Now, I was so happy to see that launch uh, that we've been talking about and I'm just gonna let NASA give you a little recap of what finally happened. Tim, we have no sound. Thank you. Let's try this again. See what happens. Share screen, share sound. Let's try this again. All right.
50 years after we last left footprints on the moon, NASA's Artemis 1 is our first bold step towards getting us back there and pushing us farther than we've ever been before. You are looking at the world's most powerful rocket and Orion spacecraft live on launch pad 39B. But the energy here is palpable as we attempt to make history today. We're gonna learn so much about the solar system from the moon and even about the Earth. Range weather, weather is go for launch. The mission management team has been told to give it go to proceed with terminal count. On behalf of all the men and women across our great nation who have worked to bring this hardware together to make this day possible, at this time, I give you a go to resume count and launch Artemis 1. Four stage engines start. Three, two, one. Boosters in ignition. And liftoff of Artemis 1. We rise together back to the moon and beyond. <laughs> is now traveling 607 miles per hour. The harder the climb, the better the view. We showed the Space Coast tonight. What a beautiful view it is. The first step in returning our country to the moon and on to Mars. We are understanding now from the James Webb Space Telescope just how big and vast this universe is. There's a lot out there to explore. And this is the next beginning. Orion is now flying free, attached to the European service module and on its journey to the moon. And there's a little uh, follow-up here. One. We rise together back to the moon and beyond. I was so happy to see that launch and I know many of you uh, know that I've been bringing update after update after update of this and all the delays and then I was it was, I was tickled a little bit when some of you checked in with me the day that it launched uh, by text. I thought that was really nice. And um, we'll continue to follow this journey and future journeys uh, here as our, you know, our backyards have a direct connection to what happens up in space, um, if only through the wonder of our eyes and, and our imagination as we look upwards. So if you'd like to follow along, NASA has a daily blog with updates and, and they just had posted an incredible video of an Earthrise from the moon. I know we saw one of those with the 60s. Uh, we got a, a, another one um, just posted. So, and there are many other uh, concurrent lunar missions, including the Hakuto R lunar delivery system I've been talking about. This is the private public venture, uh, the kind of Amazon service to the moon that's also been littered, littered with delays, but now that's scheduled for November 30th, so less than a week. And then in a kind of Moving a little bit away from the moon and to Mars, another exciting bit of space news was recently reported in the journal Science uh, with what with this picture can only be headlined, where's Wally? Uh, the Mars rover Perseverance, which has been wandering around for almost two years now, has, has discovered that the soils in the crater in which it landed have been exposed to water at least three times in its history, uh, and that the soil is full of organic molecules, which are the building blocks of life. So. Uh, stay tuned, we'll know, know more about that because uh, in, in about a decade, all of the samples that, that this little rover has been caching like a squirrel on the surface are set to be gathered up and delivered back to Earth for further analysis. So pretty exciting stuff. Okay, that's the space stuff. Now we'll move on to the cranberry. Uh, in addition to being rich in antioxidants, the cranberry is rich in cultural history and the focus of this talk is on the fascinating ecological history, in addition to uh, what it's become as a celebrated part of, of fall and winter feasts and gatherings. And so the best place to start understanding the cranberry, in my opinion, 
is to go to where it all begins, the bog. So you may know of a bog as a muskeg or even a quagmire. Those are other names for bogs. Um, and one of my absolute favorite places to look for bogs is in northern Wisconsin. So let's pretend that we're there. Uh, a bog is a, is a type of wetland that's characterized by the accumulation of peat. And peat is uh, partially decayed, decayed plant and animal matter. And what's important to know about bogs, actually one of probably the most important thing to know about bogs is that they're excellent at capturing and holding carbon dioxide. And right now we need all the help we can get in that department as we combat global warming. So this is, a, this is an ally. Um, but the other important thing to know about bogs is it's a really hard place for things to grow. I love the wildlife community that's, that does grow there, but they've adapted to a really harsh place. So if you're a, a plant and you live in a bog, you're tough. Um, you know, th these are the plants that, that legends are born from. Uh, nobody messes with the bog plants. You're, you want them on your team, on your side. It's a really hard plant place for plants to grow really harsh place and as such we have some harsh little plants so the the soil is characterized by very low oxygen extremely low nutrients uh, and high acidity uh, and so there aren't many things that can grow in bogs but the at least a lot many different kinds of things that can grow in bogs but the plants that have uh, adapted to this environment they've evolved beautifully so for instance bogs are where you find carnivorous plants you have the sundew and the pitcher plants, the bladderwort. Uh, if you're on the East Coast, you have the pretty endangered Venus flytrap. And locally, one of the best places to find carnivorous plants like pitcher plants is the, is the Cedarburg bog, which, as some of you know, is not a bog, nor is it in Cedarburg. It's actually a fen outside of Newburg. So could be called Newburg fen, but um, fens function like bogs. And so is also they're a great place to find things like pitcher plants. Um, these plants in particular have adapted to eat animals because they grow in such nutrient-poor, acidic, anaerobic soil. And then probably the major group of plants that have evolved for the harsh conditions in a bog uh, is the family Ericaceae. And we know of them, or you probably know them as the heaths uh, and sometimes as heathers. So it's a very, very large family that includes some well-known plants starting with our star plant today, the cranberry. And I'll throw the blueberry in right away because the cranberry and the blueberry are, are, are very closely related. Um, and then additionally, this family welcomes the huckleberry, which kind of looks like a blueberry. Um, and then to be a, a, a kind of, I'll, I'll, I'll channel my inner Carolyn Washburn here and say, I, I hate to be a cranberry ninny, but these aren't actually berries. Uh, the, just like the, the pumpkins and eggplants and watermelons that are berries, these are, are false berries. They're epigenous berries um, because they don't meet the definition of a true botanical berry. And I go into all of that in, in um, as gourd as it gets on the pumpkin. Uh, but the most of the, when you think of a, you know, your textbook, right? A flower becomes a berry. Fruits and berries come from flowers. But in a weird twist with this group, uh, the flower, produces the berry, but it remains attached and functional. And so you don't get a flower turning into a berry, you get a flower producing the berry. And you just have this really strange situation where you can have several generations of flowers and berries on the same plant. A unique adaptation, which is likely due to this very harsh environment in which they grow. Um, so these non-berries, uh, these Ericaceae plants also include the rhododendrons, uh, like the azalea. And then again, these heaths and heathers that are often spoken about and written about and uh, drawn and, and kind of celebrated, particularly in Europe, uh, Northern Asia, and, and, and then the Northern part of the Americas as well, because that's tend to, tends to be where they grow. Within the Ericaceae family is a genus called Vaccinium. And uh, this, this retains our friends, the can cranberry and blueberry. And then uh, th this has got a lot of important foods for humans. It's, it's, uh, and likely some of these have been in your fridge via your backyard. So in addition to cranberries, blueberries, and huckleberries, uh, you have the 
really great berries like bilberries, also called wortleberries, um, or a favorite of my Swedish ancestors, the lingonberry, also known as the cowberry. Uh, lingen is Swedish for heather, although I prefer to think it comes from linger because I imagine lingering when you're picking, picking lingonberries uh, as a kind of cathartic and satisfying process that induces introspection. So you want to linger while you're picking it, but no, it actually just means uh, heather. Um, but you or, or you can linger while you're eating the delicious jams that they make. But uh, all of these berries, well adapted to, to the harsh climates, the harsh soils. So that's something to think about next time you're eating one of these sweet berries that aren't really berries. They all grow in northern climates, high altitudes, or very nutrient-poor soils. So hardy plants producing some of our wonderful desserts. All of these species are low-growing plants. They often trail around, trail along the ground uh, with rhizomes. And maybe every once in a while, you'll get a shrub that'll pop out of that stem. Um, they're not vines, though, for a couple of reasons. They're not climbing anything, and they don't have, uh, and they do have woody stems. So the flowers are pretty complex. The flowers can also be hermaphroditic and self-pollinate. So they can pollinate, they can reproduce sexually or asexually. Um, the, the roots tend to have a strong mycorrhizal network, which, as we know, and we're learning more and more about this, this wood wide web, the mycorrhizal associations are hugely important. Um, so it's kind of neat to think about with these plants in particular, they grow in such harsh environments. And so really what serves them well is a lot of different options in that harsh environment. So probably the that would be their biggest adaptation, a lot of options. So again, they can be pollinated externally or internally. Uh, they, can, they can sprout new ones um, asexually. They can uh, retain their flowers after the fruits form. So you have these multiple generations on the same plant. They kind of run on an 18th month cycle rather than a 12 month cycle. They can creep along the ground. They can shoot you know, several feet in the air. And then they have this strong mycorrhizal relationship. So really what it means is they're not investing in one survival strategy, which works really well for some plants, uh, but they're investing in a lot of different strategies, kind of like the jack of all trades, master of none. And mainly because in the Arctic or Alpine or bog environments, like conditions aren't steady. You never know when you're, you're going to get great conditions for growth um, or, or conditions that are not conducive to growth. And so you kind of have a strategy for the good times and the bad times. A lot of plants will grow during the good times and then wait out the bad times. Uh, but these plants have a strategy for no matter what's going out on, they have this A, B, or C strategy. And so that that's a pretty cool, you know, adaptation in and of itself is, is the way this, the, this, this group of plants has evolved, um, these specific adaptations. So it's from this stock that we find cranberry. And then our next challenge is to identify which plant you're referring to when you say cranberry. So if, you, if you're hiking around here in Milwaukee, uh, and you're in a, a nice place like Washington Park, these, the natural areas here, you're going to find what's called the high bush cranberry. Not at all related to the cranberries in our food, but probably named because it certainly looks like it. Um, and what I love about this plant is if you've ever bitten into a raw cranberry, the one we use for our food, you know, it, it's you can kind of probably trick your kid into eat, look, oh, this berry looks so delicious, but, you know, you kind of get that eye popping bitterness when you, when you, crunch into a raw cranberry. Um, and the same is true for this high bush cranberry. In fact, I dare you to try to eat one of these. And public safety announcement, please don't ever eat a wild berry unless you're absolutely confident you know what it is. But I will tell you, these high bush cranberries are very nutritious and very safe to eat. But if you do take me up on eating one of these, um, you might not forgive me because they taste absolutely horrible. Uh, and then I know this from experience, kind of being dumb and young. Uh, I think I was dared to eating one and, you know, I wasn't hurt, but boy, that the taste that gets in your mouth, it stays there. It's forever. And it's awful. It's like objectively awful. Um, so, so in some ways eating a, a wild high bush cranberry is kind of like a rite of passage, right? Like you have to try it once in your life to experience it. Um, I, I really wish I hadn't. Uh, it feels more like a hazing experience, um, but 
I'm not the only one because even the wildlife uh, probably think that the the cranberries are are uh, not not too tasty because these are usually the last berries to go in the winter. They're the last things left on the shelf when nothing else is available. Um, so definitely not sought after even by wildlife, but it's very important to that wildlife because in harsh winters, um, the the high bush cranberries might be the only thing keeping some animals alive. And of, and then as as you get later in the winter, the berries start to ferment a little bit more. And then, so in addition to the very high nutrition you get from these berries uh, to go along with the awful taste, you also add some high alcohol content, which probably helps with the awful taste. And then you get some animals, uh, some mammals, some birds that will get a little intoxicated after eating these if it's later and later and visibly intact. You can, you can actually see them kind of stumble around a bit. Uh, you'll see a cedar waxwing hit, hit a branch with not, not quite the perfect landing that it, that it normally gets kind of, kind of stumbles. Um, so kind of fun if you get to witness that. And, uh, this is one type of cranberry. Um, so I don't know, actually, it, it might be fun to bring this one to your dinner table. And I'm not, you know, cause you, you could, you could, uh, you could kind of take that route of bringing it to your dinner table and giving it to that uncle that you don't like and, and see what happens. But actually the reason I think you should bring this to your dinner table is that high bush cranberries make excellent jams and jellies. So once you add the sweetener to balance the awfulness, uh, it is really delicious. In fact, one of my favorite community members who has since passed uh, was Edie Walter. And for about 15 years, anyone that spoke at the Urban Ecology Center was given a jar of Edie's high bush cranberry jelly. And it was the only place you could get it. She didn't sell it. Uh, she only gave it to speakers at the center. And so her jams went to people like Bill McKibben and Wendell Berry and, and Gaylord Nelson uh, and me. I was fortunate enough to speak and get a jar and it was so delicious. So. Um, yeah, and, and and then one other just quick note about the high bush cranberry was uh, I found out a fairly disturbing bit of phylogenetic news for for those of you that are into this kind of thing. Um, if if you're learning how to identify plants as a naturalist, one of the things you look for is does the plant have alternate or opposite branching based on where the branches come out of the stem. It's really helpful. In, in identifying plants. And so early on uh, in my career, I learned the phrase madcap horse, which helps you remember which plants have opposite branching. So if they're opposite, they're, they could be one of those. If they're, if they're not, they're likely something else. So mad, M-A-D, M stands for maple, A stands for ash, D for dogwood. Those are all plants that have uh, opposite branching. Then the horse part is pretty easy. That's horse chestnut. So maple ash, dogwood, horse chestnut, all have opposite branching, but then you have cap, mad cap horse. And cap is a little bit harder. It's a little more erudite. It's like, so cap, cap stands for caprifoliaceae, uh, which included the viburnums, the high bush cranberry, but then recent evidence as these phylogenetic people often do, uh, they move things around. And so, the high bush cranberry is no longer in caprifoliaceae, it's in adoc adoxaceae. So that kind of makes this really nice phrase, madcap horse, uh, not as useful. Um, you, you might have to, we might have to change it to like madcap adoxa horse or something, which is going to be harder to remember. But uh, this is one plant with the name cranberry, the high bush cranberry. And it's important around here in native habitats. But I think most of us associate cranberry with the berries in the genus Vaccinium. And even then, you could be talking about more than one species. So we already mentioned the objectively delicious lingonberry, uh, or a name that just rolls off the tongue, Vaccinium vitus idaea, which is named for the sacred mountain of Greek mythology, Mount Ida. And vit vitus is a vine, so this translates as the vine from Mount Ida. Uh, the lingonberry is a, a eastern hemisphere, old world species that has uh, many colloquial names from lingonberry to partridge berry to cowberry, um, and it's also known as the mountain cranberry. So lingonberry kind of refers to the species across the pond, but it actually does grow 
um, in the Northern America just usually has different names. So it deserves mention here among the list of nice edible cranberry plants. So you have the highbush cranberry, uh, you have the mountain cranberry, and then if most of us, again, hear the word cranberry, what we're thinking of is one of two plants, depending on, on what side of the world you're on. So if you're in the Eastern Hemisphere, you're likely referring to the cranberry as Vaccinium oxycocos, uh, which is primarily grown in Northern Europe and Russia, and seen here nestled comfy in its bed of sphagnum moss uh, in that wonderful bog environment. And this is a great picture because you can see the little runners uh, along the ground. So the plant is spreading horizontally on the ground with these very small, delicate, woody stems. And this is a good place to point out, you know, from this harsh environment, they have these really waxy, leathery leaves uh, that help it as they're often in water for, for many, many times. And so they have to deal with with uh, not, not so much uh, getting water, but not, you know, getting water away from it or keeping that water from being harmful to it. Um, so if you're at a British holiday meal, this is likely the cranberry you'll be enjoying. Uh, in Britain, this is simply called the cranberry, but it's also called the bog cranberry, the swamp cranberry, the fenberry, or the marshberry, all excellent references to where they grow, uh, bog, swamps, fens, and marshes. Uh, sometimes known as the small cranberry, for a reason you can probably guess. This does grow naturally, like the lingonberry, in the Western Hemisphere, but it's just a little more popular, especially for cultivation uh, on the other side of the pond. Here in the Americas, the cranberry that has gained the most popularity is Vaccinium macrocarpon, known as the American cranberry, or the bearberry, or the large cranberry, or if you're here, just the cranberry, um, which then leads us to the question, okay, what they're all types of cranberries, where does the name cranberry begin with? Or where does it come from? Where does the name cranberry come from? Cranberry is derived from the word craneberry because this was hundreds of years ago. Notice that the that intricate nodding flower that's so complex um, resembles the head of a crane. And so the, that's that's where cranberry comes from. And the large cranberry is native to the north and northeastern parts of the Americas. It's only found on this side. Um, and because it's adapted to colder environments, it also makes its way a bit down to as far south as, as Tennessee and North Carolina. You can kind of see that little finger of green down there um, because that's in the Appalachian Mountains, you have higher environments that are colder. And so it, it is able to, to finger that south a little bit. Um, it's also been introduced and naturalized in the Pacific Northwest. So that's where the red parts are on this map. Um, and it's also been introduced and naturalized in Europe and Chile. And so it's interesting to note that the commercial production of cranberries uh, in the US is actually quite limited by this distribution. Because even though it grows naturally in that wider range, it's essentially only produced in these five states. And it's, uh, it's interesting to note that, you know, a, a bit about each of these states. So this, this is uh, barrels, of, barrels of cranberries produced in a year. In this case, the year is 2017. And so you get a good visualization of who's producing most of the cranberries. So um, there are cranberries that are also produced in, in Canada and Chile. And Chile might not make sense, but again, you have those high alpine environments that, that work well. Um, so if we kind of take away Chile and Canada and just look at the United States, uh, you know, those of us in Wisconsin, we are the by far the biggest producer of cranberries. And the types of bogs that naturally occur in Wisconsin that gave this perfect habitat for cranberries are the bogs that of, of our north woods, and they were produced by glaciers. So as glaciers advanced and receded, they kind of scraped the land. They scraped the soil, they changed uh, the composition, and then they produced a lot of depressions that acted as what are called aquacludes. And so you get water that's kind of trapped. It's not part of a system, uh, like a flowing system or, or sometimes not even a spring system. And then the water kind of festers and uh, that's where you get that really 
low oxygen, high acidic environment. Um, these are the bogs, again, that I absolutely love. And they're also the bogs that the cranberries actually love. So kind of the central native uh, place that the cranberries evolved uh, is a place that, again, is pretty harsh to most plants. So this is why Wisconsin is the number one producer of cranberries. Then you go number two and number three, you have Massachusetts and New Jersey. And um, they also have native bogs, but their bogs are, are quite different from ours. Uh, so ours, ours were these glacial produced bogs out, out on the East Coast. You have uh, coastal bogs that are part of this a kind of dune swale environment. Um, and so uh, what's important to these stories is that these are very sandy environments. They're dynamic environments. Um, and it's with this knowledge that somebody by the name of, of Captain Henry Hall in the early 1800s discovered that as you're trying to cultivate and, and grow these cranberries, he found that if you periodically introduce sand into the cranberry bogs that you're growing, the, the, the cranberries grew better. It, it, and what happened is it just essentially mimicked the natural bog system much better and made the, you know, the cranberries more comfortable and whatever they needed. Um, and so, so these dunes are very different. They're aeolian dunes, very windy environments with moving sand. Um, and so that's what Henry Hall discovered that if you, if you want to cultivate these, try to mimic that environment as much. Um, you don't need that with the Wisconsin uh, cranberries, uh, but out east with the environment that, that worked much better. So you have, you know, the glacial bogs of Wisconsin that wild cranberries adapted to, and then you have the coastal dune bogs of New England that wild cranberries adapted to. And then that's essentially why the top three cranberry producing states are in those two areas. And then you have Washington and Oregon, which are relative newcomers. Um, it's naturally wild cranberries didn't grow there, but they do have great environments for growing cranberries. So uh, they were introduced and then naturalized and and now produced for, for commercial production. So that's why Washington, Oregon kind of round out the, the top five cranberry producing states. So with this kind of holiday episode, there's a lot more to say about cranberries, um, which you often hear me say, like a lot of these plants or animals or whatever, when you start looking into them, they really, there's just so much more uh, that I learn about them and, and, but, you know, trying to keep these to roughly a half hour episodes that, you know, our attention spans, uh, there's a lot more to say, but because they have been, there, I say, I should say there's a lot more to say because they have been such an important part of human beings, our existence for thousands of years. So really I'm kind of just focusing on the cranberry as a plant and the ecological parts of things, but it is important to hit a few cultural points, uh, starting with the fact that the cranberry has been an important food source for humans for around the world for thousands of years. And in the Americas, one of the most popular uses of cranberries is pemmican, which is which is kind of the original power bar, um, a very high protein combination of crushed cranberries, dried deer meat, and melted fat that could be stored for months, that could be taken on a trip. Um, and then there's a lot of great uh, foods that have come from the American side, that, that come from the American side, um, mixed with maple syrup, mixed with native squashes. You've got that nice berry, uh, the lower right-hand corner, that nice squash berry uh, loaded with wonderful uh, foods that, you know, include cranberries. Uh, and then it's also important as a dye has been, is a, an, an important dye in the Americas for producing kind of the eye-popping reds. Uh, also used as a poultice for wounds with its antimicrobial properties and its acidity. So very important in the Americas for thousands of years. And then uh, in the Eastern hemisphere with Western colonial culture, it's, it's mainly used as a sweet side dish, perfectly molded to the can, but also quite delicious when mixed with mashed potatoes and turkey. Uh, it sh I should point out that Cranberry production can be very harsh on the environment. And yeah, so just like with, with anything that you're looking at, it's really important to understand this when you're when you're making purchasing decisions. 
uh, when you're deciding which cranberries to purchase, when you're advocating, when you're talking with politicians. Um, some of the survival adaptations of the cranberry make it very conducive to mass harvest and distribution, uh, particularly in that it's adapted to being in the water for a long time, which would you know kill other other plants. Um, it allows the farmer to flood a field in the winter time, which might not make sense. But uh, as we know, you know, the ice freezes on top, the water just gets cold. It prevents the berries themselves from freezing, and it allows the farmers to, to extend um, when they can harvest. Uh, so that's taking that natural ecological adaptation knowledge and, and putting it into farming practices. Um, and then just for shipping even, you know, you, they can be shipped and preserved well in berries. Um, and part of their survival mechanism, when you when you think of a good bog and you think of how slow growing some things are in the bogs, uh, one of the survival, the other survival mechanisms of the berry, in addition to the ones that I mentioned, is that they can slow down their metabolism quite a bit uh, as a way, you know, similar to the way the bear and the chickadee can. So even though they have different strategies for different times, um, they can also resort to that that same strategy that other animals or plants use, and they kind of just slow themselves down, which is why they're so uh, slow growing um, and long lived. And it's important to recognize that it is the Thanksgiving holiday, and and this means very different things to very different people. Uh, what I was taught in school was the the colonial version of events that was shaped to benefit the storytellers of the first Thanksgiving. Um, so there's not much I can really say on the subject other than I encourage everyone to, to just continue to relearn the narrative that you may have learned, uh, start to listen to new storytellers to broaden your understanding of the, the violent and unjust past. Um, if you are interested in deepening your relationship with the food that we were eating this, this time of year and the, the ecological and, and social relationships in particular, I came across a really wonderful article written by Sean Sherman who's founder and CEO of The Sioux Chef and author of The Sioux Chef's Indigenous Kitchen. And he wrote this for Time Magazine in 2018. The title is, is on top here. Uh, and there's a particular quote that, that uh, the Nature Guys highlighted in their podcast. Um, and I quote this not because I see it as a way forward that kind of gets us, that allows us to get over the past atrocities and kind of sweep them under the rug. I quote this as a way forward that allows us to move forward uh, with those past atrocities, not forgetting, but remembering. Um, and here's a few lines from that article that I'll just read to you. Uh, Many of my indigenous brothers and sisters refused to celebrate Thanksgiving, protesting the whitewashing of the horrors our ancestors went through, and I don't blame them. But I have not abandoned the holiday. I have just changed how I practice it. The thing is, we do not need the poisonous pilgrims and Indians narrative. We do not need that illusion of past unity to actually unite people today. Instead, we can focus simply on values that apply to everybody, togetherness, generosity, and gratitude, and we can make the day about what everybody wants to talk and think about anyway, the food. People may not realize it, but what every person in this country shares and the very history of this nation has been in front of us the whole time. Most of our Thanksgiving recipes are made with indigenous foods, turkey, corn, beans, pumpkins, maple, wild rice and the like. We should embrace this. Uh, for years, especially as the head of a company that focuses on indigenous foods, I have explored native foods. It has given me and give all of us, can give all of us, a deeper understanding of the land we stand on. It's exciting to reconnect with the nature around us. And then he goes on to, to provide some specific examples and I'll share this link. There's some great things in there. But then he ends with, uh, no matter where you are in North America, you are on indigenous land. And so on this holiday and any day, really, I urge people to explore a deeper connection to what are called American foods by understanding true Native American histories and begins and begin using what grows naturally around us and to support Native American growers. There is no need to make Thanksgiving about a false past. It is so much better when it celebrates the beauty of the present. When I eat cranberries, I try to connect with my inner bog in northern Wisconsin the harsh but beautiful environment with tamaracks and black spruce with a multitude of native bees and insects. Uh, the cranberry grows here. It, it takes its time. Cranberries are slow growing and they have time to gain a lot of wisdom. A cranberry plant can live over a hundred years. 
Uh, it takes its time deciding when and where to use the multitude of options it has at its disposable, disposal uh, for growth and reproduction. Then when it wants to, it produces a berry with sweetness built in, but it makes you work a little bit to find it. So thank you for joining me today. I hope you all have a wonderful weekend. I'll see you next time. I'm going to stop sharing my screen.